My name is Dr. Heather Gornick. I'm the co-director of the Vascular Center at University Hospitals Harrington Heart and Vascular Institute in Cleveland, Ohio. And I am the proud chair of the 2024 ACC AHA guideline for the management of lower extremity peripheral artery disease, or PAD. And with me today are my esteemed vice chairs, Dr. Herb Arano, who's the medical director of the Heart and Vascular Service Line at Henry Ford Health in Detroit, Michigan, and Dr. Phil Goodney, who is the chief of vascular surgery at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center in Lebanon, New Hampshire. Hello, gentlemen. It's good to be together again. And we're here today to celebrate the release of this long awaited document, which has been basically about four years in the making. And the document actually is sponsored by, of course, ACCAHA, but we had nine collaborating organizations and societies working with us on this document. And we had an incredible guideline writing committee. This guideline rec writing committee really represented all vascular subspecialties, um, also nursing as well as physicians. We also had a podiatrist for the first time we had clinical researchers and epidemiologists. We also had some patient perspectives and we had just a diverse mix of writing committee members. So I'm very excited about this document. We're gonna take the next few minutes to take you through the highlights of the document, hopefully enticing you to download the full guideline and give it a read. Um, I'm just gonna take us through some of the basics in the document. And then my partners are gonna tell us about some of the specific aspects of PAD care, particularly management of chronic symptomatic PAD and chronic limb threatening ischemia. One of the things that's new and I think pretty exciting about this document is it gives us a, a framework to think about clinical manifestations of PAD. And actually our writing committee defined four clinical subsets. There's patients who are asymptomatic, but we really emphasize the fact that even asymptomatic patients may have functional impairment. There's patients with chronic symptomatic PAD, which includes claudication and other exertional leg symptoms. There's, then there's patients with the most severe subsets of PAD, and these are the subsets associated with the most morbidity, potential for limb loss and mortality, and that includes chronic limb-threatening ischemia and acute limb ischemia. And the document really covers all four of the clinical subsets. The other aspect of the document that I'm personally really excited about as a vascular medicine specialist is the updated and enhanced section on medical care. So there's actually a whole section now recognizing the importance of preventive foot care in caring for patients with PAD. And there's also some new medical therapies so making their first appearance in the guidelines are some new medications that are effective to prevent cardiovascular events and limb events in patients with PAD. And that includes low-dose rivaroxaban on top of low-dose aspirin to prevent cardiovascular limb events, GLP-1 agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors for patients with diabetes and PAD, and then PCSK9 inhibitors and azetamibe for patients um, who've not yet achieved their lipid targets on high intensity statin. So I think there's some new things in the medical therapy and um, uh, there's some great algorithms also that were developed by the writing community to walk the clinician through stepwise in how to think about these patients, classify them, start medical therapy, and then decide if revascularization is needed. Beyond the sections on medical therapy and foot care, the document then dives into very specific clinical scenarios and also revascularization. So Herb, take us through the approach to chronic symptomatic PAD. Heather, thanks for that great overview. Um, I, I think I want to start by emphasizing how important this change in nomenclature is around patients who have chronic stable symptoms. Historically, I think we've often referred to them as having claudication, but as we know, many have atypical symptoms. And so this broader terminology, I think, reflects that. In those patients, after full trials of medical therapy, uh, guideline directed therapies, structured exercise, if they still have lifestyle limiting symptoms, 
that's the point at which we then begin considering and discussing revascularization. And that discussion should involve weighing the risks versus the benefits of proceeding down that path. Revascularization uh, is reasonable uh, in this situation. And what revascularization options should be considered uh, is going to depend a little bit on anatomy. And so we've spent some time on how to manage aortoiliac disease, acknowledging that endovascular revascularization is effective in that situation and that surgical revascularization is reasonable. We've looked at common femoral artery disease, which, as you know, can be at times controversial, and I think acknowledge that we still have a lot to learn about how to manage that from a revascularization standpoint, and we address that as well. And we've also touched on the fact that we don't really know when it comes to below-the-knee disease whether revascularization in that setting is uh, beneficial or harmful uh, in patients with chronic symptomatic uh, PAD. And so all of this can be uh, gleaned from this updated version of the guidelines. Uh, I would just finish, I think, by emphasizing it's important no matter what path is taken in patients who uh, undergo revascularization, that we don't forget about guideline-directed medical therapies, that those still remain a very important, a critical part of our overall uh, treatment paradigm. Yeah, absolutely, Herb. And, and one thing that just came to mind is we actually had a whole separate section on longitudinal care that emphasizes that even after revascularization, these patients need to be followed and treated with medical therapy for the long haul. So thank you for that summary, Herb. So next, we're going to turn our attention to chronic limb-threatening ischemia. And our guideline writing committee spent a lot of time on this section of the document, mainly because while we were in the process of writing this document, we had two new seminal clinical trials published and a lot more to discuss. So I'm going to turn it over to Phil, who's going to talk us through CLTI. Well, thanks very much, Heather. And again, congratulations and great leadership in, in guiding the, the group through the uh, the very com complex both clinical picture and evidence that emerged during the time course when we put this guideline together. Uh, so this is a particularly exciting time for those of us who take care of individuals with chronic limb threatening ischemia. There's an embarrassment of riches in terms of new evidence uh, and new perspectives to consider. And that was all carefully considered by the team as we put the guideline together. And it was great to have a multitude of different stakeholders at the table, whether it was individuals who would do endovascular treatments, surgical treatments, combinations of both, offloading experts, patient perspectives, medical therapy experts, and epidemiologists and scientists who guide patients in the clinical care or guide individuals in the clinical care of patients with CLTI. All of those perspectives came together to formulate the recommendations shown in the document. And those recommendations varied in terms of how controversial they might be certain recommendations are, came together easily, like mom and apple pie. We all agreed that multidisciplinary care for patients with peripheral arterial disease is certainly advantageous for both for patients, for individuals, for health systems. Careful attention to offloading and wound care, also critical elements, and these are nicely outlined in the guideline to give guidance to clinicians in the care of patients with ulcerations and wounds as they're treated for their CLTI. Uh, it was then a bigger challenge for our committee as evidence began to arrive in an exciting fashion. Important multi-year randomized trials that evolved both from around the world presented new evidence for us to consider. And many of these new variables are now considered as part of the document. Some of the new evidence that emerged helped guide our treatment choices, especially as Dr. Aaron now alluded to, related to revascularization of the infraangular segment and the crural segments. Uh, as those new trials emerge and become incorporated into evidence, they can help guide our decision making. And one of the important variables that the guideline put forward into place was knowledge of what conduit was available, as well as what patient preferences were in terms of their choices for revascularization. Those are some of the highlights of the CLTI section, uh, Dr. Gornick, and it'll be uh, great to disseminate these into the community. and. Uh, especially as the trials and new information begins to be understood by uh, clinicians who care for these very complex patients. And beyond chronic symptomatic PAD and CLTI, there's also dedicated sections on asymptomatic PAD and also acute limb ischemia. We don't have time to talk about all of the clinical subsets in depth today, but really encourage the viewer to go and please read the document. 
Beyond our clinical recommendations and review of the clinical evidence, our writing committee spent a lot of time discussing risk stratification, identifying patients at highest risk, managing special populations, and also the important topic of health disparities. So Phil, take us through some of the highlights from the document. The document is gonna introduce the concept of risk amplifiers for uh, patients with symptomatic peripheral arterial disease, especially those who have socioeconomic factors that might drive some of their risks for amputation. And our attempts to better understand and better study those particular risk amplifiers in years to come is one of the things that the document carefully considers. I'm appreciative of, of my colleagues on the writing committee who carefully tried to formulate some nice graphics to help us better understand the complexity, both at the individual, the patient, the health system, and regional care environment level that those, those aspects may have. And I think they also put into place important recognition of the patient perspectives and better understanding how those individual patients could best incorporate into the healthcare system, because I think we provide outstanding care for patients with PAD who are at risk for amputation, but better engaging with those patients and making sure that they deliver that care both for the beginning to the end of their care episode with peripheral arterial disease, which can be a lifetime for many patients, is an important goal. And the guideline helps to try to prioritize the important steps in that process. Absolutely. And to, to build on that, I think we as a writing committee also took the opportunity to use this document as a call to action and wanted to raise awareness on areas that need more focus in terms of research and also advocacy of our, our sponsoring and collaborating organizations to make care better worldwide for patients with PAD. So Herb, take us through those research priorities and some of the advocacy priorities we identified. Yeah, happy to do that. I think like any good study, it answers fewer questions than it raises. And I think that was the result of our process of reviewing the evidence base. We ended up with many questions that we realized remain unanswered and that will need our attention, just like we identified many advocacy priorities where uh, our work will just be starting. There are many evidence gaps, and we focused in on 11 of them, and there are also many advocacy priorities, and there we focused in on eight. Examples of the research gaps, for example, the evidence gaps are uh, a better understanding or a need for research around uh, patients who are asymptomatic and the role of screening and how that might uh, influence the implementation of medical therapies, development of new medical therapies and evaluation of them to prevent major adverse cardiovascular and limb events, or MACE and MAL, more trials to look at how we use antithrombotic therapy and what the ideal regimens, the role of remote um, efforts to have our patients undergo exercise therapy for symptom mitigation, and a number of other research priorities that we felt deserved attention. On the advocacy front, there are a number of notable areas. One is the American Heart Association-led PAD National Action Plan which helps raise awareness and facilitate detection and treatment of PAD amongst our patients. And so we felt this was a high priority. Uh, it goes without saying that dissemination of the guidelines is another advocacy priority and that we need to incorporate more quality outcomes within some of the work that we're doing. There are issues with access, and you've heard about some of these disparities already a short while ago, and we feel that's an important focus. And then, of course, other means to improve access, such as telehealth and other interventions. Well, I think um, we're near wrapping it up. I want to thank, um, first of all, both of you for your partnership in leading this document and getting us over the finish line. I uh, want to thank the cardiovascular community at large for its patience. You know, many of us have been asked over and over again, when are the PAT guidelines coming out? So we're glad they're here. I really want to thank our very thorough peer reviewers and our sponsoring societies and the AHA and ACC for, for providing us the resources for this document. We really encourage all of you viewing to please take a minute, download the document, check out the figures. There's just tremendous and very detailed evidence de tables of all of the trials that were referenced in developing the guideline statements. And we wanna thank you all for your attention.